so the ECB. So we've already seen, obviously, Australia and New Zealand now QE. Right. ECB, that's the big unknown because there seems to be, this is where we start to move into the world of juxtaposition between politics, fiscal, mm. monetary. Talk me through what you're thinking about that. And then, and then I want to come back to bond yields again, as we said. Sure, sure. Well, the ECB, if we thought July 2012 was whatever it takes, this is whatever it takes cubed. And to think that Madame Lagarde, with one loose sentence, undid nine years of Draghi when she said, unforgivably, my job is to not control spreads. That was quite courageous of her. She realised within five minutes how foolish that was. And ever since, the ECB has been in repair mode. And if we thought the summer of 2012 was whatever it takes, one would imagine, Raoul, that to avoid fragmentation risk, which is the great terror of European policymakers, as we know, to avoid fragmentation risk, the ECB is going to have to be the buyer of first resort of all these sovereign bonds, and Italy in particular. And there's a bit of a discussion around that I'm sure you've seen and your subscribers would have seen a lot of headlines. And again, last night, oh, the Dutch and the Germans are dead against euro bonds and joint and several liability and all this kind of stuff. OK, that's unfortunate. You would have thought there'd be a little bit of more political uh, solidarity right now across and within economic and monetary union. It's not happening. But you know what? I don't think it matters because the ECB has an open ended balance sheet here. And I think they're going to need a lot of it. So they are buying and buying and buying. Their priority is to prevent a risk, a fragmentation premium in Italy in particular, for obvious reasons. I suspect they're going to be on the hook as the sovereign buyer of first resort for a long time to come because there is no alternative. I would recommend we all keep a very keen eye on BTPs, obviously. Um, I am somewhat concerned, to say the least, that despite extraordinary and persistent ECB buying role, you know, these BTP spreads keep leaking. And that's not a great sign, not a great sign at all. So the ECB, I assume, is a constant presence in all these sovereign curves for a long time to come. I shouldn't overlook the fact that they've given tremendous regulatory relief to Eurozone banks, to be clear. That does not mean a catalyst for any sustainable re-rating of European banks, but it does mean that they are free from balance sheet restrictions and via the ECB's financing facilities, they are getting enormously cheap funding at a cost of minus 75 to put into eligible collateral uh, of all sorts, which creates a positive carry trade for European banks. And again, that doesn't mean you own them, but the idea would be that that positive carry trade enables the best European banks to muddle through. And the final point, as much this also applies in the United States, the regulatory relief that we've seen in the United States, such as at long last so a, a one, one year rain check or relief on the leverage ratio, it's not, as some people have said, to allow primary dealers in the United States to go hog wild on treasury repo and anything like that, it's to ensure that there's enough balance sheet capacity to lend to the real economy, which is obviously the critical thing here. It's about the real economy and ensuring that there's ample credit flowing to households and small businesses. And that's critical in the US as much as it is in Europe. So I just want to go back to the treasury market right now, just because it's been interesting to me that you imagine that the Fed want to have yields as low as possible, mm -hmm. but they're kind of a bit sticky still. The, yeah. the market hasn't woken up to the game or there's something else going on. What, what, why is that? Why have bonds been kind of stagnant for the time being? Why, are they not, why is the whole curve not trading at zero? There's a lot of bonds to be sold, Ralph. <laughs> That's the Who's short selling? answer. Who's selling them? The sovereigns? Well, there's some of that, and we can see it in the Fed's custody data there's definitely been some liquidation of treasury securities by, um, let's call them North Asian reserve managers, huh? Yeah. That's, that's, that's no surprise no. that the holdings would go down. 
But when I say there's a lot of bonds to be sold, I should have been more precise. I meant there's a lot of bonds to be issued, a colossal amount of bonds to be issued, more than anyone can perhaps tally up yet, because we've got the CARES Act that went through Congress the other day, and that's going to require a lot of issuance. And now they're talking about, oh, well, the cost of borrowing is free. Let's, let's tag on another two trillion of infrastructure or whatever. There's no barrier to issuance. And I think quite a few people, Raoul, are, try, are starting to or trying to tally up the amount of treasuries that will need to be issued or even bonds or BTPs or gilts or Australian government bonds to finance this, this bridge that all these governments are trying to provide through COVID-19. And I wonder if that is in the back of investors' minds in terms of, you know what, I know we're going through an economic emergency, perhaps an economic catastrophe. All in all, if the world's going into a sudden stop, Treasury yields ought to be perhaps a lot lower, given the disinflationary undertow. However, when I imagine the future supply, perhaps that ensures that yields don't fall too much yet. Now, of course, the flip side of that is that for macro financial reasons, it would be a disaster as we work our way through, or perhaps we've arrived at this very tenuous equilibrium, <laughs> if we dare call it that, in financial markets, where realised and implied volatility is coming down a bit in equities, which is no bad thing, somewhat similar in the better parts of the credit markets, giving everyone a time to sort of go take a deep breath and reflect on what their right exposures ought to be. The worst thing that could happen in this kind of mini time out here is that long-term nominal and real bond yields start to go up a lot. Yeah, I'm worried about the real bond yields. Exactly right. And the good news for the Fed, and by golly, it's taken a lot of buying, is that they have arrested what was a very nasty sell-off in tips, or should I say yields backing up a lot. And these days, Raul, even positive 10-year tips yields in the United States would probably be orthogonal to any hopes of a rapid rebound uh, out of this mess. But, but how can you possibly – look, I don't know how big the deflation number is going to be in CPI and core CPI, which lags it, right? I have no idea how big it is. Is it 5%, 10%? I don't know, but it's going to be monstrous, even if it's – 3%. Four. The problem is, is with bond yields at close to zero, you only get a tightening of financial conditions. Temporarily, you would think so. And at the highest level, that's not a bad way of thinking about it. But then I also have to calibrate this extraordinary support that the Fed and other central banks are providing. And then I need to calibrate it another step further, because I think we're all aware but this is going to be a very, very difficult couple of quarters if we're lucky. I mean, this current quarter, every piece of data is going to look a little bit like the Great Depression. And I very much doubt anybody incorporated that in their bar models, right? <laughs> Possibly uh, not. Except, except Renaissance technologies, right? Anyway, that's another conversation. That's why. <laughs> and we all know it's going to be hideous. If we're lucky, we get one quarter of data that feels like the Great Depression. And then, if we dare to imagine the third quarter, we get some kind of scrappy tentative recovery. Although it won't actually be a recovery for a lot of people, it'll feel like a really bad recession that comes after the Great Depression. Now, the reason I flag that is because there's no doubt we have this extraordinary disinflationary undertow for the current quarter. But as realised and implied volatility comes down, markets will start or dare to start looking through and mm -hmm. saying to themselves, OK, near term disinflationary risks are given versus, dare I say, it, medium term inflationary risks as we attempt to restart the world in a heterogeneous fashion with bottlenecks everywhere. And Whilst the unemployment rate will probably be ending up quite high for the foreseeable future, we may have an extraordinary situation in the third quarter-ish. I don't know yet. This is just a theory or a thesis. We may have an extraordinary situation in the third quarter where the unemployment rate remains high, 
and firms are having to bid back for labour to get people into the labour force again to help them expand capacity and deal with the global economy spluttering back into life. So I, I hear what you're saying. I don't doubt that we're going to get some extraordinarily bizarre CPI prints through the middle of this. But I'm trying to imagine the second half of this year when the world starts to come back online. So temporary disinflation, a given. Structural reflation I'm or sure. yeah. more inflationary, I think that's what we need to keep our eye on. And again, it comes back to the Fed. What, what's their trade-off? Well, they were told us, they told us going into this, ironically, they were going to consider yield curve control and revising their inflation target and everything else. And by the way, what they're doing now looks awfully like yield curve control without actually targeting a particular rate because they're in the market every day. But they are going to be so cautious dialing back any of this liquidity provision as we move through the rest of 20 and into 2021. And the irony might be that the inflation that they've long desired might arrive in a meaningful way later this year, but they will remain on hold. And that's so, the long-winded answer to your question about yeah. between inflation and real yields and everything else. So going back a bit to the comments about the issuance of bonds. Yeah. So we know there's probably more to come from fiscal stimulus. Sure. Around the world, probably quite a lot, particularly, you know, when you go into, let's say, Q3, you know, things have dragged on a bit. You know, the economy's not there. We expect to start to see stuff. And certainly around the US election, we're going to start to hear a lot of noise. Now, I presume the central bank will be the bar of every bond issued. Yeah. And we start moving to the MMT style environment where basically the government balance sheet, as they're trying to repair everybody's balance sheet, right. you know, the households, the small businesses, to everybody else, the central bank has to step behind it. And that's globally the same central bank bid everywhere to try and allow governments to run massive deficits to do this. How is your thinking of that evolving? Implicit in your question is central banks everywhere, which to me means competition for global savings, right? So if we assume that any central bank anywhere is not going to be a backstop buyer of all these bonds to be issued, we assume that one or more private sector actors will find them decent value. And consider the case of the United States. I mean, yields are still positive a bit. They're certainly not zero. But there are no incentives, for example, for the fully hedged Japanese investor to buy any treasuries at current prices, let alone structured credit. There just aren't. Unless, unless you get the dollar down a lot. So in yen terms, to use Japan as a, as a proxy for global pool of savings, the only way you entice private capital back into the treasury curve in a meaningful way that would enable the Fed, for example, to step back, I think is via a very substantial dollar depreciation, which we might talk about later on. So my why would it not be, sorry, just to, the other thing is why not the US pension system, which is massively underweight treasuries and has a, a, a need for it because of the aging population? Well, that's what I thought. But one of the most extraordinary things of the past month is that you look at holdings of Treasury securities and holdings of strips have actually declined in March. Now, if I read the data correctly, it was $15 billion. Who cares? But obviously, these strip Treasuries have been very, very popular for US pension funds in particular managing their long-term liabilities. So I'm like, why on earth would US pension funds, assuming they're the biggest holders of these strip Treasuries, why on earth would they be net sellers? What other exposures do they have that they got called away from? Because I don't think there's much redemption risk. So the broad answer to your question is, yes, of course, at a price, the US pension system will be a buyer. But then I need to calibrate that for capacity in terms of the amount of bonds to be sold. And of course, there are banks as well who would be happy to own treasury securities in their HQLA buffers. So, of course, there's, there are buyers of Treasury securities around, but I still come out to myself and say I, I very much doubt if the Fed's going to be backing away much from supporting the Treasury market because they cannot afford 
to have any sustained rise in nominal and especially real yields. So I think they're kind of stuck. But there's this broader question about competition for global capital, right? There's, you know, Australian superannuation funds, are they going to be buying huge amounts of Aussie government bonds? Well, I guess so. How about Japanese investors? You know, what's the cost of hedging your FX risk into Aussie and stuff? And then you go around the world and you say, who's been the keenest buyer of treasury securities or certainly one of the biggest constituencies of treasury ownership over the past several years? And unsurprisingly, it's the sovereign wealth guys or more accurately, the reserve guys. And if for reasons of downstreaming liquidity, to their own financial systems, they're no longer a net buyer but a net seller. You know, you keep coming back to the Fed, I'm afraid, being the only game in town. So we have a lot of unfinished business in government bond markets. I would be surprised if central banks have stepped back much, if at all, by the end of this summer. You may have seen yesterday the Reserve Bank of Australia articulated that they were intending to step back a tiny bit from the rate of bond purchases they've been conducting while still targeting three-year Aussie yields at 25 basis points. And perhaps it was another misunderstanding by markets, but even the merest hint that the Reserve Bank of Australia was stepping back from their uh, current run rate of bond purchases saw a pretty nasty sell-off in Australian government bonds and the tenure in particular. And I think, Raoul, that's not a bad metaphor for thinking about how difficult it will be for the Fed to step back and to finish this point, how impossible it is for the ECB to step back. 